So then officially now welcome to another uh, session of juxtapositions, a lecture series of the Studium Generale at the Berlin University of the Arts. My name is Lukas Feireis. I'm the host um, and as part of my visiting professorship here at the school, I encourage you to unlearn, to think, to act, to create and to collaborate wildly outside of your comfort zone. And the intention of this weekly format of personal, creative and intellectual input from very diverse fields um, of artistic knowledge and expertise from all around the world is to basically broaden our minds and promote um, positive discourse across binaries, boundaries, borders, disciplines, norms, forms and protocols and to celebrate really the power of a like non-binary um, cross-pollination, entanglement and collaboration. So juxtaposition is very much about deprogramming, deprogramming programming normative and kind of restrictive separations in education and about pushing for a systemic and inclusive and a connective change. Um, so I, basically I'm trying to connect, create connections here for you. So to embrace these uh, juxtapositions and contradictions, to ask questions, to show up, to stay with the trouble and actually to create problems. So that said today, um, cross-dimensional artist and agent of healing, Tabitha Rezer, is joining us remotely from French Guayana. Hello. Thank you Hello. for being here. I'm super, super thrilled um, to have you on board with us today, Tabitha. It's also beautiful to see you in the lush green in the background. It, it really um, opens the heart uh, sitting in Grey Berlin today. Um, yeah, so uh, let me quickly tell you where or how I came across your work. And I think this was um, through the exhibition and research project and publication, Digital Imaginaries. Um, uh, it was called uh, African Positions Beyond Binaries, I think uh, the subtitle, that brought together artists and makers and architects and social scientists to examine the digital futures on the African continent. But, and this was only my personal introduction to your work. But to briefly introduce you to our audience, uh, you are um, a self-proclaimed seeker, an artist, um, a healer. Uh, I believe you're also a teacher of Kemetic and Kundalini Yoga. And um, you challenge um, the kind of the legacies of colonization and patriarchy through healing, activism, art, and film or moving image. Um, and your work encompasses a multitude of ideas and theories and practices and in a way also a sort of collage that ranges from I don't know, African cosmologies to ecology to digital technologies to spiritual practices. And you combine styles and media um, elements of what you would call like high and popular culture. And thereby you ingeniously weave together cosmological, spiritual, social, and technological narratives into very powerful poetic and political statements kind of that address social injustices on, on, a, on a micro and a, and a macro level. And um, yeah, you are, I don't know, basically a multifaceted, a multivalent, a multidimensional kind of holy morph artist whose work appears to be also critically embracing the interdependent dependency of these kind of aforementioned realms to, um, and I think you call it, restore the energetic imbalances in past, present and future. And all of your work is driven by a very strong sense or agency of healing. So that said, um, welcome Tabitha Rezer to Juxtapositions. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, yeah, I need to stretch a little bit my being, so you can do the same if you feel cold. Uh, thank you for having me here, and um, that's all. <laughs> so uh, um, I was thinking um, maybe um, you can maybe introduce yourself to the audience. I did now kind of uh, uh, kind of a wrap up, but maybe you can introduce yourself a little bit to the audience. And then um, we engage in, in, in a mixture of kind of a talk and conversation. So at the moment when you feel like uh, now you can ask a question, I can jump in. If you want to talk, I'll let you talk. So we'll, we'll, we'll try to go with the flow. Sure. Uh, what can I say? 
I don't know. This is always like a, a triggering question a little bit, you know, like to present oneself because um, I feel people always expect you to answer the things that you do, you know, and I feel I'm, I'm trying very much not to identify myself with the things that I do, you know. I feel like caught up a little bit, you know, so I want to explore the part of me like who is Salita beyond an artist, beyond this, beyond that, and all the things that I do, all the things that validate me in the world or that gives me value, you know? So it's like beyond all of this, without doing anything, without uh, producing anything, like what's left? That's really what I'm after, even within my work, and that's why I call myself a seeker because I'm seeking something, I'm seeking the depths of existence and the depths of myself, you know? And that manifests me trying with many tools you know, and in different ways to like dive the deepest that I can, you know? Into uh, hopefully like uh, the source of creation itself. So that's really, you know, what mm. I'm doing with my being and what I, try to become so that's the thing so in my being in that pursuit of like the beginning of it all or the end of it all it's a, a yearning a very deep yearning to become that or that nothingness actually because i don't even say in um in astrophysics, you know, that before the Bing Bang was a, a nothingness. And in all like uh, scriptures, they also describe uh, before creation was a, a dark ocean or a nothing. And you know, so that not being, how to embrace that not knowing, not being, not not existing, but that has potential for full the fullest of existence. So. You know, it's that dance that I'm trying to be more intimate with. You know? And the more you're intimate with creation, you know, with a piece of body, with those trees, with life, with anything, maybe the more I can get intimate with what birthed it. You know? So that's my life. Okay. And, and maybe, thank you. Um, actually, I was so impressed in the beginning before we went online officially um you kind of showed us the view i mean where are you actually right now and could you kind of share with us um, um uh, your, your view so to speak and then tell us where you are so this is my little cabin okay my clothes are drying then some little office up there and then choo -choo 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 -choo, my little home and then you go inside there and then there's the the inside uh, and then that's just the Amazonian forest. So I'm in uh, French Guyana, the land of my paternal ancestors. And um, it's a small piece of land in South America between Brazil and Suriname. And it's basically the only uh, non-independent land in South America. So it's still France to this day. So every French Guyanan person has a French passport, vote for French president, learn the history of Louis the Fourteenth at school, and you know we are we are French, you know, which is a little, um, to say the least, uh, complex. Yeah. Yes. And uh, but besides this, yes, when the only five percent of the of the country is inhabited, the rest is just Amazonian forest. It's just like the forest is everywhere. And I'm in a little piece of forest, trying to um, to learn, you know, from the the forest to to grow with it, to be to be undone, actually, you know, because that's what the forest does. It's like dismantle what you thought you were or what you thought you knew, you know. And uh, I think that's what I try to do in everything, you know, whether it's through my artworks, my action in the world to try and like you know just become a little more soft not just soft i mean whew, actually in so many ways <laughs> to embrace softness as a radical strength or power you know, to like you imagine a okay um, a bowl of clay 
not a ball, but a lump of clay. You know, when it's wet, it's all malleable. You can make so many forms. It has so many potentials. You know, it's like you can make a ball, you can make a vase, you can make a plate, you can make some abstract ball, whatever, figurine, uh, anything you want. But then, you know, you put it into fire and then it hardens. And then it can only be this. And so I feel many. I'm having a hiccup here. No, no, no. Hello? I had a short hiccup. Okay. Um, from where? No, I, I, you were gone for a second, but now um, it seems to be good. Okay. Um, so I was saying about the clay, that like our being, it's like we, we become like rigid, you know, and so attached to who we think we are, to what we think we want, we aspire to, the way we want to live life, what we think is success, what we think is fulfillment, what, you know, it's like we have. And so maybe the draw, and I think that's the spiritual journey where it's about, you know, it's to become soft again, you know, to be back to the lump of clay so that you can build another reality for yourself, you know, and for who you are and always shifting according to the situations, you know, so yes. And um, yeah, thank you for these uh, philosophical insights. And uh, <laughs> wait, I'm not even trying to be too deep. Sorry. I'm, I'm trying to be, uh, I can no, be. I agree more, but maybe you have to imagine now for also the those are listening and many of the students that are maybe not familiar with your work yet. Yes. yes. And um, could we? Um, and you also deliberately decided not to show, but kind of talk uh, rather. Do you think we can talk a little bit as a as a beginning a warm up about your work? Um, yes. I mean, I could spend two hours just talking about your artist statement because there's so many like key terms mentioned in that. But um, to okay, I think to, we can do something like yeah. Can to, we can we go on a little uh, on a little journey? I, I would love to go on a journey. I'm totally okay. ready. So maybe we can do this. Okay, so. And I think everyone's gonna understand my work from this, you know? Or maybe, a, yes, I think an important aspect, you know? So, okay. So we're gonna do a little um, gathering, you know? Uh, gathering with uh, what came before us you know? and meet our, our ancestors, you know? And try to welcome them in the space because they, they burst us and we're here because of them, you know? So, okay, so we're gonna sit, I'm gonna guide you. And at any point, if you feel uncomfortable, you know, you can just stop, you know, and just be bored, pause, and wait for it to be over, no pressure, you know? And, uh, and just try to be, just listen, you know, inside to what's uh, what's happening, if any, you know, and even if nothing's happening, that's also fine. So you can close your eyes, you know, try and sit comfortably, like relaxed, you know, wherever you are on your chair, on your bed. If you're lying down, it's also fine. You know? so take a deep breath in and out. And keep breathing very slowly and deeply through your nose, through the nostril. And with each breath, feel yourself a little more rooted into the floor, into your chair, into the earth. Feel uh, supported by her, nourished by the land and what she provides, protected, guided, 
is very anchored, as if like the roots of your being are going deep, 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 deep. deep. and leaves and their big foot. But for this, you must be very anchored. So let us uh, connect with the earth that supports us before we welcome the one that came before us. So I'm going to ask you to bring a presence of your ancestors one by one. And even if you didn't know them, you didn't meet them, it's okay. Just invoke that presence and see what it feels. You don't need to have a visage, a face. You don't need to know them or be close to them or anything. So I'm going to talk about mothers and fathers. But whatever their gender, you know, wherever they fail on the gender spectrum, it's beyond this. It's really about the, the seeds of uh, the genealogy you know, of your lineage. So you're going to invite your father to stand behind you on your left, behind your left shoulder with your father's left hand on your left shoulder. So just see how that feels within you. What happens in your being with that presence. Now you can invite your mother behind your right shoulder. with your mother's right hand on your right shoulder. Just sense within you how this feel for a moment. And now you're gonna swap them position. Place your father behind your right shoulder and your mother behind your left shoulder with their hands on your shoulders and see how this feels. Now behind your father on the right, you're gonna bring their parents with your father's father behind your father on the right and your paternal grandmother behind your father on their left. Now behind your mother, standing behind you on the left, you're going to bring their parents, starting with your paternal grandfather behind your mother on the right and your your maternal grandfather sorry and now your maternal grandmother behind your mother on the left so you now have your two parents and four grandparents behind you and you're now gonna add the parents of your grandparents who so add eight people now standing behind you with the father on the right, the mother on the left. So you have your parents, grandparents, great grandparents, and now you're going to add 16 great great grandparents. And just slowly keep adding now 64 behind you, and another 100 and 28. And then keep adding, adding until you have hundreds of people behind you. And as they grow, you keep bringing them, calling them, you have hundreds and hundreds of hundreds until you have thousands of people. And you imagine a sea of people with you at the top, 
like a, a pyramid, you know, a big V, and like a big V stretch far behind you into the horizon of time. You just have so many people standing right now behind you. All those people being your ancestors. And they stretch back till the beginning of time, till the first people walked the earth. And even beyond the first people that walked the earth are common ancestors. The earth, the water, the fire, the air, the mountains, the rivers, the volcanoes, all this who allowed life to happen, from which we received the gift of life that was received even further down through the birth of our planet Earth and even before through the birth of the solar system and even before our galaxy and maybe even before through the Big Bang or all the bangs of creation that burst from nothingness which was created and from that primordial sound because they say it was a sound, a song of creation that primordial vibration, that primordial gift of life spread into our planet, into the rivers, the mountains, the oceans, the land, until the first beings came forth, always giving the gift of life forward in their own way until it reach some people standing behind you and they receive from their backs, behind their shoulders, the gift of life. And then it spread, spread across many, many, many different lands until maybe your great, 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 great grandparents somehow received the gift of life and met and birth your great, great, great grandparents. Life forward to your great grandparents who themselves lived in joy, in pain, but survived to birth your grandparents, the four grandparents standing behind you right now, who themselves somehow, to some unknown reason, or known to some, birthed both of your parents standing behind you. Maybe you never met them. Maybe they're gone too soon. Maybe you didn't receive what you needed from them, but you received the gift of life because somehow you're sitting here right now. And they met to bring forward the life that you are, the life that we are. And so much life happened behind us. So much experiences so many lands, so many foods, so much drama as well, trauma as well. Yes, there's been pain, there's been suffering, but there's been survival, lineage of survivors across many wars, many pandemics, many displacements, maybe many atrocities. But within this, there's been much joy and much love for sure, somewhere, somehow, there's been love, there's been communities cooking together, eating together, rejoicing, dancing under the moon, there's been celebration, there's been wedding, there's been funerals, there's been 
those days is been tending to the land, farming, because our ancestors have eaten the fruits, the vegetables of their land that nourish them. There's been uh, many celebrations. And so we have our capacity as we sit right now to call on these gifts, these capacities, these experiences. Our ancestors are here to, to guide us, to inform us, to share with us their immense library and immense resources that has lived so much beyond our single life. There's a, a data centers of lifetimes upon lifetimes that have walked the path we are walking, gone through what we are going through, for sure. And they're always there, ready to to share, to share their wisdom, to support us in our own journeys. That's the gift of our ancestors. So yes, this gift, but there is also sometimes burdens that we must uh, work with until we work through them because it is not our responsibility to carry their pains forward. So maybe if you feel so cold, you can take a, a little moment to turn around, like literally turning your body around if you can, to face that big V, that big ocean of people behind you, so you face them. And once you face them all, that ocean of life that allowed your life, and it might not be easy to accept this gift of life, for many it's, it's hard, whatever comes forth. If you can, for some it may be easy to express gratitude for all the all the life that has gone before, so that would exist today. All the dramas, all the pains, all the blessings, all of this somehow had to happen for us to, to be there. However unjust, however unfair, however hard, however beautiful, these are the conditions that made our life possible. So if we can, we can thank you for this life thank you for the gift of life only if you can and maybe we can take this opportunity to give back the burden that is not ours to carry you can say I see your pains I honor it and I leave it with you. I see your pains. I honor it and I leave it with you. And say what comes from your heart. And when you are ready, you can turn around once more in your own time so you can have your ancestors behind you again because that is where they belong behind us and often we are stuck looking back you know, having some entanglement with what has happened so if we stand here clear with our ancestors supporting us not training us but being the resources that they are the power that they are We can feel and say that we walk free, guided, supported. And maybe you can take some time to see in which way you want to share the gift of life forward. Some of you may have children, some of you may want, but some of you may not want. 
So whatever you want to burst, whether it's an artwork, it's a project, it's a vision, it's a community, it's a, a giving how to share this gift of life because we have it and we must use it wisely. This is our responsibility. Just take a moment to bask in that support that you have available at any time. With this inner guidance, this ancestral guidance that is here to birth whatever you may birth as you journey forward and uh, share the gift of life in your own way. So, thank you for all of these people behind me, behind all of you who have, have gathered today who have sat in community for us to experience the immensity that we are. When we are ready, we can take a deep breath in and out. Deep breath in. And out, feeling the sea dissipating as we allow them to go, knowing that they're always there and can be called at any moment, that we're never alone. We are never alone. And very, very gently, when you are ready, you can open your eyes. with me, with us today. Yeah. Thank you, Tabitha. This was probably the most unique way of describing one's work, I have to admit. Thank right. you. Thank right. you for sharing. And mm. kind of um, into, yes, into practice, because one must embody this, you know, what that means. Okay, I need to charge my computer. <laughs> Where are you? Yes, and that's exactly what we've done. We've been charging our computers. That's so true. Oh, yeah. and, and this might be also hard, you know, for, because sometimes we carry very heavy things and that's why we cut ourselves from what came before, you know. And bringing all this, so can be a bit uh, rough. So be gentle with yourself. No. Yeah, that's but true. Uh... Maybe I can go in there and ask a few questions. So this was very, yeah. very touching and very um, moving and very unique. And, and, and describing, I think, for everyone who's also not familiar, we get the scope of what you are aiming for. You know, without describing my work is about film and this and that but kind of what what are you going for and i also remember in an interview that i read with you you also spoke about like seeking healing in combination with seeking justice and there was one thing that really stuck with me me and you kind of repeated this also in your let's say this was a guided meditation or reflection you no know, on our 
generational planetary genealogy uh, of ancestral knowledge in a appraisal or for the gift of life, what, what we just um, experienced and which you just shared with us. But in this interview, you saw it, said we are loyal to our ancestral pain as well. No, not only the knowledge and the pain, so we reproduce it to relive it. And, and because we are so entangled in our past, we need to acknowledge this ancestral realm, which you now just shared with us um, to do. And this is what you said, the work actually of social ju justice. So and then you said social justice is a spiritual practice. Can you elaborate and uh, elaborate a little bit on this one? Because that's a that's a very unique um, approach that you're taking there. Right. Uh, that's a, a line from my teacher. So I'm blessed you know, to be guided in my own journey of uh, figuring things out. You know? uh, because the work of uh, yeah, of healing and any type of transformation cannot be done alone, you know. But uh, I don't know. We see many. I'm sure you're all familiar with like activist circles, you know, or maybe you're not. But like often, when people want to change the world, you know, they become very angry. And that anger is beautiful because it's from that anger that you have, have the source of like, this is not right, you know, this really feeling of like the injustice and we should all be angry by or angered by injustice because otherwise you sit back and say, okay, that has nothing to do with me, just I don't care, you know, and that happens a lot, you know, many people don't care, but those that care, many of them care because it affects them personally. You know, so they've been often very hurt personally or feel connected to like a, a cause, you know, that's painful for other people. And then you engage in it and you want to, you know, support it, contribute to, to a change. But often that rage burns. I know it happened to me. You know, I used to be very angry at the world, like raging, like, like I was just like, going mad you know because i just saw all the injustices and so all like the world is just a big mess and we are being assaulted everywhere we're on this you know it's like it's hard <laughs> when you we you realize you know like the violence of our world and it's as if that rage that was a fuel then goes against you and it makes you even more sad even more depressed and not very efficient at the end you know and so that's why a lot of like you know groups or actives then they they dissolve you know and they're not in the cause anymore because it's just too much you know when being can't carry all this and so if you don't have a practice you know of nourishing yourself of it's not even nourishing. It's of like transcending that pain that you carry that made you sensitive to a pain of other. You know, if you still carry it so tight, then all the time you're gonna meet someone's pain, it's gonna wake up your own pain. And just, that's why we, we talk about all the time, trigger, 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 warning, I'm triggered, you know, this triggering, this is, because we're all walking around with our little like in a, inner triggers it's like the trigger is inside us we all say okay he's triggering they are triggering but it's like okay i don't know if it's a good analogy but I'll try so let's say you have um i don't know you hurt yourself no i guess it might work you have a big like wound but that's like you know that has like i don't know what you, you know that white juice like i don't know what it's called yes I mean, yeah. so it's really yes it's a very bad wound you know then <laughs> then okay you have this on the right arm but not on the left and then imagine someone comes at you you know and poke there in the wound you're like Aah! you know it's gonna be so hurtful so horrible but if that same person came on the other left you're like okay like why are you poking me like you know? and then that's it you just walk away and in a way well i'm not really sure you know this might be not politically correct okay but 
in a sense, if you have, we all have those like wounds, but not on our bodies, you know, inside. You know? So if you're affected by racism, for instance, or let's say, or anything, then somebody says something and suddenly it's like, it's just too much, you know, and you start screaming or crying or it's, it's very hard. Or if somebody tells you about what happened to them or, you know, it just reflects that thing in you and so it's just too much. But that is because you have that thing inside if it healed, you know? Somehow the thing healed, you know, at time, it gives you a poking, you say, uh, 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 uh. but suddenly with time, someone, the same thing, so the same external event can do the same thing, but you're going to react so much differently. So that is, uh, really, that's the journey of like, you know, spiritual transformation is like, so that the external environment don't really like condition the way you feel. So you can move through the world a bit with more ease. It's like lubrication, you know, it's like you, it's just easier to go through life because often we go through life and say, and that's a spiritual process to, maybe to do that jump. work for ourselves. Yes. Maybe I can jump in here, Tabita. You also said that um, central to your personal healing journey was an understanding scientifically and spiritually of vibrations. Yeah. So let's talk about vibrations or vibes. And because, you know, all things in our universe are constantly in motion or, or vibrating. Like even objects that appear to be stationary are in fact vibrating. No? They're oscill oscillating or resonating at, at kind of various frequencies. And I think even Einstein confirmed that, no? that he said like, dude, everything is vibration and everything is, is energy. And, um, and this is not philosophy, he said, this is, this is physics. Like matter is just right. um, basically, matter that we perceive is just because the vibration has been so, so, so lowered. So how, yeah, what, what, what does, um, can we talk about vibrations in your work? Sure, okay, okay I'm gonna show, now I'm gonna. Vibrational alignments or misalignments that you try to kind of, Mm, redirect again. Right. I'm going to show you a, a video. How did I do this? Um, Can I? Now I need Flora's assistant. Okay. <laughs> Flora Leon. Um... Okay. Uh, Tabita, in which yes? language does uh, Webex uh, talk to you? In uh, English or? Um... Yes, in English. Okay. So you should have a button saying share um, at the bottom um, below our pictures. So there are um, the, the mute. Uh, I need to become the presenter before sharing content. Okay, wait a second. Sorry for this admin. Oh, I can just take it so it's fine. Okay, now it should go. Okay. Share, share screen. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing my screen? No, not yet. So you chose um, a, a window? Yes, now it starts. Okay, so let's see. Okay, it's not this. So I want to talk about cymatics and show you. So it's a science of bringing, of shaping matter through sound. And this video is very, very uh, reflecting. So maybe you know this already, but for those that don't, and I guess my internet is uh, not friendly today. Otherwise, you can also talk us through it. Okay, so basically, you stop your, your screen sharing. Okay. No, too bad. But uh, basically, this experiment. So please, when you go home and you have a chance, look at like cymatics experiment on YouTube. You know, and it's basically they put sand on a plate, and then they put a specific frequency, like. Ee! you know, different sound and it creates geometrical patterns with the sound or on with the, the sand. So the sound affects the shape of the sand. 
So to see this like uh, in a way with that experiment just reveal a process that happens on a much smaller scale is that each sound that we make, each sound that you hear affect form. Like from the world of sound came the world of form. It's like and and the other way around each form has a certain sound. And basically it's like we are a uh, a walking song each of us are emanating a certain song you know and like an instrument we can tune ourselves to just adjust like our our harmony you know? so that we we're just more pleasant you know our symphony is more tuned or in tune with the the greater sound which is, you know, or could be, you know, maybe that's a bit like the mystic of existence, but that first sound of creation, you know, even scientists, they say the Big Bang was a big, like, a big sound. And that sound is the same sound that it's still now, like, creating the world, you know, and form. It's like we are, that same vibration is still ongoing, and they find, like, residue of that vibration still now. There's a map of this. It's like the residue, uh, well, I forgot now how it's called, so you can find it or I can share it later. So it's still, it's still around in the same way, you know, it's for me what was very transformational to understand like the, the power of sound and many cosmology has said, even the Bible said it, you know, and what is the line and the light was and the word, no, I forgot, sorry, and the light, da da da. He said, I know, I don't know, sorry for the, like God said light and then light was. Hmm? It's just like the power of the world that the world creates. It's like the scientific, that sound affects matter. But also a disease is a certain like disharmony of our inner song or even like a, anxiety or you know you could you can understand the world through vibration that a certain plant vibrate that's why like many communities have been able to communicate with plants that's on a like vibrational uh, harmony or like even ideas or like if you vibrate at a certain i don't know you know dimension some thoughts attract you know come here but if you're like then only those kind of thoughts i don't know if that makes sense but we basically our songs seek harmony you know and can shift we can transform like the whole practice of like chanting or meditation or going in nature or like prayer or all the traditional practices you know that were put in place, were meant to change our inner frequencies because that can also alter states of consciousness and then you can receive certain information, certain message. So it's all like a, a, a science of, uh, of creation, really, you know, of what it is that uh, needs to be done in the world, you know. So if we put that energy into our inner song, you know, like the way we would speak to ourselves, you know, maybe it would uh, be a bit more gentle you know with what sounds are coming to us because that little voice of i'm not enough i'm not no, no, i'm not gonna manage no, 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 no. all of this you know anxiety like that shape our song you know the songs that we are so, so coming from now vibrations as being central to your healing journey or the healing journey let's talk about healing as a practice with it, which is inherent in, in, in your work, which you also described as a form of unlearning. And you also described, you know, these various healing technologies, you call that. Um, and um, yeah, I'd like to know a little bit more about this and also how we can imagine how does like a process when you start a, as, as an artist now, you get invited, you start a work or piece. How do you how do you use all of this that you kind of shared with us now? in actually producing works? How, how, how can we imagine this process? 
Yes. Um, basically, I think my art practice is just a way of sharing my own journey with its emotional, spiritual, political journey, you know? And then I, I share this in a way, you know, to yeah, disseminate. And um, often I, I mean, many of, I see my work as documentary in a way, you know, because I talk to a lot of people, you know, and I go and I, I seek, you know, it's always that idea of I seek like uh, guidance from uh, others. And with all these little bits of information, you know, whether it's like literal information that I received from an elder or from a scientist, because I work a lot with scientists and I love that, that space where like spirituality and science meet, you know, for me it's a very fertile ground because I feel they both have the same yearning, but they express it in in very different way. You know, it's like they want to know more about the cosmos, about existence. You know, but maybe the scientist wants to understand it. You know, mathematically with a certain like rigor and through logic, and maybe the mystic or the spiritual seeker want to experience that world, the cosmos. But still, it's the same thirst. But maybe the language is different, and I. I don't know, I want to conciliate those worlds, you know, because I feel they have a lot to learn from each other. You know? And and I guess it's also because a lot of like spiritual teaching are dismissed, you know. So maybe it's also part of my journey in a way to to see that there's a science in that, because uh, that's also a legacy of uh, of colonialism, you know, and coloniality that say, okay, this is nonsense, this is folklore, this is superstition. But like, if you dive deep, you know, into many practices, there's a a very profound science. And now with quantum physics, you see more and more the links, you know, because it's just the ecology of the unseen. So it's different, well, different expressions. So anyway, so I try to make a, a connection there often. And then, so it's, it's gathering, so it's like I'm a storyteller, I think, you know, it's gathering information from different realms, whether that I download, whether that I download from Google directly, I love scrolling on the internet like everybody else, or that I talk to people, or, you know, and then I make a, a little story with all of this, a collage that looks um, a bit like crafted on my uh, Premiere Pro and uh, try and uh, make sense of the what makes less sense you know? so i think that's really the 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 process it's uh, a lot of my work really centers on the technologies of information and communication it's like how do we receive data literally so I spent a lot of time exploring the internet, its architecture, the power that it entails, the oppression that it uh, provides. But then beyond this, what are all the networks of information and communication, like ancestor communication, which uh, I mean, in my practice and image is something that's very real. You know? So the information that you get through that channel is also a technology of information and communication, literally you know, or communicating with water, like water can also be an interface for receiving information. So it's really about like bringing back, or not even back because they have been there and they're still there and they'll always be there, you know, but kind of allowing, you know, spiritual technologies, digital technologies to coexist, you know, it's not about saying one is better than the other, but they're both different ways and tools of receiving and sharing data and uh, on a different dimension, maybe, you know, but they're there nevertheless, you know, so to maybe give them a bit more legitimacy, yes. Maybe I can jump in there as well. Sorry for always interrupting, but trying to kind of navigate here through. Um, I basically have two questions. One, but for a little bit later, I would also like to talk again about the because we, we addressed that issue last week when we talked to J. Karen Morgan Lotek about like the therapeutic and healing power of uh, artistic practices. Um, 
um, that's one thing. And the other, but to keep this one in mind again, is since you just mentioned also your um, um, attempt in your artistic work to understand the various networks, whether they're technological or they're cosmological or they're ancestral, and you know which you shared with us before. Because in this lecture series, we are also trying to bring across the notion that all the issues that we are facing globally, a cannot be solved single-handedly or by one profession, and uh, also not without um, the kind of collaboration or collaging that's enabled by digital technologies. Yeah, and um, but um, digitization is obviously at least a two-sided sword, and that's something that you really dive in. You just mentioned it a little bit, so. What do you see as the potentials, but also as the dangers of our digital information and communication technologies? I mean, I think it's with any kind of technology, you know, technology is just a, a tool and it depends who holds the tool and for what purpose. That's really what is going to determine the effect of that use, you know, so it's the user and usage. We can make it healing or poisoning. Yeah? In the same, I mean, I can talk about the digital ones, you know, but like spiritual technologies also have their downsides, you know, and sometimes I use wrong to do wrong, you know, so it's not to be romanticized. So, for, I mean, we all know, you know, for like internet or digital technologies, the, the effect that they, they have, I mean, on the social level, they breed like, um, a lot of like hatred, you know, all the bullying, cyberbullying that's happening, you know, or all the 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 network, the fascist network, pedophile network that is enabling, but at the same time also a lot of like resistance network, you know, that's also enabling. So it's a uh, it's a uh, yeah. I don't know if you can have uh, only the really the good happens. parts, you know. I mean, then maybe on a more structural way, you know, I mean, to use those platforms, we take them very, like, uh, as granted, but it's used so much, like, uh, geological resource, so much water is needed, you know, to cool down uh, those data centers, so many electricity, like, so much even distortion or... Um, no, distortion is not the way, but uh, the world that... Um, I don't know, like, what's the world where it will come? Because the internet comes through, like, cables in the ocean. So it disrupts it disrupt many, like, reefs, many, like, uh, animals, many, like, patterns of fishes, many, a whole, like, ecology of the abyss, you know, is destructed sometimes for us to have access to those uh, technologies, you know? So it's not free, you know? I mean, we pay for our, like, monthly uh, data thing, you know? But also, like, the cost that the Earth is bearing is, uh, is huge. It's very big, and we're not always uh, conscious of this, you know? Of everything that was put in place for us to be able to, like, scroll like this, like, infinitely, you know? or even, you know, like the exploitation, you know, that happening to build this, like it's part of a system that uh, is actually very violent. You know, the architecture itself is also quite violent. So yeah, I did some research uh, about it that many of those cables are layered onto like former colonial shipping routes. So that also is maybe a, a coincidence, but uh, it carries uh, an energy somehow, you know, like what are we actually doing with those networks? Like, how are we using using them? They're very powerful. But everything that has power is uh, is dangerous because, like, as a society, like the world that we live on, like we are mad, you know, and not mad as a, you know, I mean, uh, mental disease is not. Uh, okay. It's another conversation, but that's not what I meant, you know. But like we are. Um, completely like fueled by the you know greed by like uh, you know abuse like oppression like it's 
it's a tragedy, you know, but that is us as well. Like, it's not enough to say like, oh, yes, this, 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 like collectively we bear like this burden. That is the society that we made, all of us, you know? Mm -hmm. And now in this context, what, what can art do then here as a, as a healing practice? Sorry, you were gone for a second. Did you hear my question? Yes. Yeah. What can I do? As I said in this uh, last week's conversation, we talked about the therapeutic effect, and then I think um, kind of the idea also of art, like a ceiling or as medicine, dates back to antiquity, you know. But also recently, this kind of concept is drawing much more increasing interest. It feels like in the medical and science communities, even the World Health Organization had a big research about like the healing power of the arts, and there's a lot of discussions on that subject. By the way, both the passive um, perception as, as well or um, experience as well as the active engagement with, with the arts so what do you think and how, how did how did you how did how this how did this journey start for you kind of to combine your artistic practice with that of a healing practice what was the beginning of this and what's your take on it um, I guess the beginning was a depression you know or like a huge anxiety Like, I was feeling like shit, you know? So it's like, uh, I need uh, something, like anything, please, <laughs> like to get uh, out of this. And yes, yeah, so, and the only way, I mean, you said at the beginning, the last speaker said the only way is through. Like, for me, it's like the only way is in, you know? Like, what's happening, like, inside. Like, uh, all the places that you don't want to see. You know, the places we are ashamed of, the places that uh, we are afraid of, the places that uh, we shut down from, the places we don't want to look at, you know? And like all those parts of the beings that we have like pushed aside that were completely fragmented, then they come and they bully us, you know? And then because we feel bullied, you know, by our own self, we want to bully somebody else, you know? And that's like, That's how you know our whole like world is. So everyone is there trying to, or not even trying, but we do it unconsciously. It's like we are spreading our hurts because we are hurt, you know. And if you haven't received love or we don't know how to love ourselves because we feel we don't deserve it, like how are we really like genuinely gonna? care and love for somebody else maybe yes our families people close to but then a stranger or then an insect or then the land or then you know uh, ancestors or maybe aliens when they come like it's because we are so we've walled ourselves so much it's like okay this is me this is mine you know and we're trying to protect so much what is me and my mind and like everything else okay you can all die I don't care, or you can all like be abused, be oppressed, like it's none of my business because me, I'm going to try and like, you know, <laughs> walls, 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 until it happened to me. Hmm? And I guess the whole healing journey and the spiritual journey is like to, to break those walls a little bit and to create such deep intimacy with like, like all of creation, me, this food, this tree, like to understand that we're really like deeply not just connected but like not just dependent but we're like uh, like in the dimension of atoms we're just all like atoms you know floating around like you that's just another form of like atoms like me you know so it's like just creating a relationship you know like, okay i am the food that i eat Like, without the food that I eat, like, there's no me. And to have that food, I need soil. Without the soil that I walk upon, there's no me. Without the air that I breathe, there's no me. Without the water that I drink, there's no me. Like, literally, these things make the being that I am. The people that I love are not there if we continue polluting our soil, you know, polluting our waters, like, living so un consciously like buying i don't know thousand of like uh, 
polyester clothes that then we swore because they can't be recycled and that anyway like that fashion is done i wore that t-shirt two months and then i'm over it you know and i have nothing against fashion you know but just saying that we're we i don't know the way we live it's like we've built a society that in order to succeed like we have to destroy everything around me everything around us and everything including our own selves you know mm. and like okay we can go on for some time but at some point you know it can't uh yeah, it's not sustainable that's the world yes and talking but about the world, yeah. talking yeah. about the world we live in um um brings me to the notion of community and community brings me to the idea of collaborations and because you're not only a solo artist or a seeker and healer um, or agent of healing but you're also founding member of different kind of artistic groups and collectives like the ntu which is a kind of south african mm -hmm. comment mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. sorry the mm -hmm. a south african um yeah, creative collective concerned with the spiritual futures of technology and also about disseminating an awareness of African science technologies. But then you are also half of the duo Malaksa. Malasha. Malasha. And also now next one coming up. <laughs> and you're also the mother of the energy house Senep. Correctly pronounced? Okay, good. Um, which is a community engaged with also African and diaspora healing technologies. Can you, can you tell us a little bit more about these, all these little communities and also these collaborations and what your learnings have been regarding this kind of collaborative, creative process? Right, so first, all of them are dismantled, but all of them will stay forever, forever in our beings, but uh, we're not... Uh, uh, or let's say it's not produced you know how tricky that is you know because it's not producing I say you know it's not it's over you know mm. so that's my own uh, and learn you know? so we're just not producing at the moment that doesn't mean that we don't exist um, but um, yeah now it's a it's a new one community that I'm trying to build it's called Amakaba uh, and seeing friend Ghana, so I'm building a, a, a healing center in the forest, you know, it's like uh, farming, ancestral healing, and uh, different practices of, uh, of mothering. I also work as a, as a doula, so a uh, doula is uh, people that support birth, you know, or women bring birth, or like people birthing, and in their, their journey into that, uh, that initiation of uh, giving life, you know. Um, so basically, I think another way to understand the, the being that I am or the things that I do is like the, the thresholds of existence, you know, supporting and understanding like their potential with its birth or death, you know, all the transformations that we go through because we need to be supported. These are like processes that need like care you know, and that need a, a community. And together, it's uh, it's hard because most have not the, the community of family, of extended family. So often, like families are dysfunctioning or not like supportive of their children's way of giving their gifts. You know, so we create our own family. So it's like a, a place where you can. Um, Go, you know, and be tended to it's while you grow. This is a tricky one. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, but Go I on. mean, com community building is not an easy one. No, it's, it's the hardest easy. thing. It it's is the, the hard thing. Thank you. So thing. What's it, what has been your biggest learning here? Of course, it is the hardest thing, and that's why I tried many times. Hmm. And many times, you know, it did not succeed, you know, and it's not about because I think each time. You learn something and you try it differently, you know, because it, so many things are needed to have a, a, a community, you know, and often community is not necessarily like same minded people, you know, or people that face the same challenges or, but it's, or it's not even necessarily people you, you like or enjoy, you know, because that's how, like a community when you're part of a neighborhood, like, you know, you should have a community spirit, you know, for the neighborhood, what is good for the, you know, 
So maybe like it's not about like oh yeah, all my neighbors are so amazing. No, tending to community, it's putting yourself aside for one moment, and that is why it's hard because most people do not like we have not learned. You know, we don't have that humility in our being and collectively even more to just put ourselves aside like okay what is good or what is the best way to act right now beyond my own interest mm. for a greater interest and often not all the time but often that might not be serving your own needs you know mm. and that we're so you know in like western thinking is all about like Nikki, what am i gonna get how gonna then okay game you know always like calculating you know like what's how we can benefit from the situation or for something but like community it's all about sacrifice not all but a lot of it and that is hard mm. very very hard like mothers know how to sacrifice you know so they have a, a sense you know because they don't have trust they need to care for their babies or the the baby cannot survive you know so it's like putting that mothering energy but to something greater than just your child to like a vision it's like how can we all learn to mother the world around us you know and that demands something so much bigger that our own like um, little um, aspirations you know that's why it's hard so and if we do that work you know of becoming just like a bit wider as a you know as a individual you know we break a bit a little bit because it's way too hard a little bit that individuality that we carry you know it's like okay okay me but i'm not so this is also me you know then it's it's easier to to be in a, or serve be in service of a, of a community you know because that's what it needs it needs people a vision of a collective potential you know and everyone give their best or what they can not even like what they can and it's not the same for everybody because often we're like oh but they didn't do this no no and me i'm doing it you know and try like no everybody have their own things to give you know and that's okay so yeah i don't know i'm still figuring it out you know now i'm a, I'm a farmer now i just finished like farming studies you know so starting a whole new journey uh, to try and be in community with the land, you know, and the uh, insects, that was the hardest part for me. I used to be very scared of insects and understand that uh, whew, mm. I need them. <laughs> maybe, maybe two last questions. I think we've been talking now for an hour. Yes. We also opened up to the, uh, to the students listening. Um, you just mentioned you finished studying farming. You have a background in both economics as well as moving image. No, I think you studied econom economics in France and then at Central State at Martins, you studied uh, moving image. Now you, you studied farming and you're uh, setting up this new center for the wisdom of the earth in French Guayana. But then again, um, and you showed us also that we're never independent from our places and people of origin into this kind of ancestral kind of guidance that you gave us in the very beginning. So now let's look at you, like having grown up in Paris and um, and I, I think I read um, both of your parents were therapists as well. Is that correct? Uh, did I say this? Yes. Yes, I read this in an interview. Yeah. I thought it's very interesting how this kind of comes back. And then I, I guess of uh, Goyanese descent and maybe French uh, descent. Or, uh, and then you lived in Johannesburg for a while in South Africa. And now you're based in French Guayana. So how, how far do you think Kind of your background both in academic studies personal family all these places so these various people places and in places have shaped your um yeah your personal as well as artistic practice slash being yeah completely i'm a consequence of all of this you know? like uh, literally i've been shaped by the the earth that have uh, received me the different lands, different communities, different uh, teachers, you know, whether academic teachers, like spiritual teachers, the different paths, 
everything and all the traumas I carry, like also the experiences that were not so great, you know, all of this um, makes this. You know? So I'm trying to accept, you know, I think that's uh, yeah, a journey of acceptance that we we have the the parents we needed to have, you know, and then the old ancestral lineage, you have the grandparents you needed to have, and that it's very hard, you know. So I'm not I'm not saying this like uh, lightly, because uh, a lot may have happened, you know, in our in our lineage or with our you know our families, but somehow there's a something, you know, that we also all have responsibility for. You know, it's not just like oh like a, I don't know a god or a spirit or to say like oh you did that so you have to pay for this and then bad things happen to you you know it's like no also like collectively like as we said previously like we are in this world because of the beings that we are collectively so so all the unpleasant things or that happen to some of us somehow we also carry a, a responsibility because we are part of uh, of that you know so yeah i don't okay. know last two questions i mean <laughs> you're saying this all the time yeah, yeah, yeah. it's tricky it's like uh, <laughs> uh yeah it's it's almost a trick um i mean life goes up and down it, you know there's success and there's setbacks um so what has been the hardest lesson for you so far Okay, I don't know how deep I can go. Is this going online? This is going online. No, no, like, don't, um, <laughs> keep, keep it on a comfortable level for you. But okay. just, you know, for, you have to imagine that we have a lot of students listening that are in the very beginning of their career, they're still in university. So it's good to share um, just um, out of experience, but lived example um, of, of what, you know, what will come. Um, and um, you know where, where you learn from right. I don't know uh, many but I guess one that I'm still um, trying to learn from is uh, yes I'm um, tenderness you know towards uh, oneself because uh, life is uh, not very gentle, you know, and uh, the art world is not very gentle also. And uh, so if there's a part of you that is not very gentle with yourself, you know, it's a lot of ungentleness all at once. And this can be very, very rough. Um, so it's, I don't know, I say, okay, last week it happened to me. It's a little, um, basically, uh, I have, I don't know, a capacity to to do a lot for others, you know. And uh, I'm also nourished by this, you know. So I do it with a lot. It was that day, last week I was running around all day. I did things for okay all my farming colleagues were setting up an NGO so I bring out an admin I have an intern I was going to do something for her then there was a pregnant woman that I'm you know supporting her journey like okay doing something with her like some you know and then uh, something for my partner and, that, and did, I didn't eat the whole day and I was like hungry and then I was late I run I hurt my thighs then I couldn't walk and then you know the the pregnant woman she offered me some pineapple and I was like no no it's okay you know and then like the whole day and everything went wrong and, you know just a, a basic kind of day sometimes you know and then i came home i talked to my partner and I was ah, nah, 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 nah. like and i couldn't even receive a pineapple <laughs> and i just started like crying you know and i was like like that's crazy i was hungry you know and somebody offers me with love like a pineapple and i was like no it's fine you know it's just like a little thing but that shows like how at least there's still a piece of me that is uh, a bit neglecting myself you know or 
to not say even abusing myself somehow. So it's easy to say like, oh yes, I used to see the art world, you know? It's like, oh yeah, no, look at this. But actually now I know it's me, you know? But it's way harder to see that I am the one who is like neglecting myself, you know? And like what to do about it. And I'm trying a lot, you know, and like everything that I do, you know, to learn how to tend more to, to this being. Like even this morning, just before I came to the talk, I spent the whole morning with two traditional midwives in another part of the country, you know, like learning about traditional massage to like turn the baby in the belly or, you know, different things. And then at the end, like they gave me a massage, you know, and they did the massage. They were like, oh, la, oh, you work too much, no? And I was like, uh, yes, like, ah, la, 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 your body is tired. Like, this is not good, you know? And I was like, mm, you know, these two women that I never met, <laughs> you know, they can just tell, you know, through just touching my body that there's just like, that yo, that person is not taking care of themselves, you know? Okay. So that's... this is me right now. Okay. Well, I hope you can sense. do that better. And I, I promised last one, and it kind of goes hand in hand with what, what you already said. Um, and this, this is the general question that I ask every time. But what piece of advice could you give all the becoming artists, architects, designers, fashion artists, uh, musicians, etc., this thing to us and to you today? Hmm. I think, okay, that's the thing I do, you know? Like, uh, it's just to never, never settle for anything, actually, you know? Like, always keep exploring and doing yourself, like, even if you think that like, you've reached what you wanted, you know, just like <sighs> destroy it all, you know, and start afresh, not a whole new life. I mean, I always start whole new lives, you know, but that's maybe not an advice, but just keep like that each time you're too comfortable, there's no place for growth, you know, growth needs discomfort. Because that's where you, you stretch, like, say, you know, those energies, like, you're going to stretch your capacity. It's like, if you're comfortable, let's say, like, that's the universe, or maybe, let's say, that's the planet, or maybe your own being planet, you're comfortable with this. Here, you feel like, okay, whew, here I'm fine, you know, life is good. And then you go just there, so, but then if you're there enough, then it's going to become part of your comfort. But then you're going to try to go there. So do this and expand until, until you meet the whole of yourself until you're comfortable in the whole world. The whole world is yours, no? But for this, you have to break those, this basically to be uncomfortable all the time, you know? And always challenge your, yourself somehow with love and gentleness if possible but uh, yeah Thank i you. think that's uh, you can expect like uh, basically expect something you don't know you know if we can dream something we could not even dream for you you know that's uh, that's good yeah. thank you um, so now you maybe your students can talk to me yeah now um if um now is a long talk and um, so all of you guys um thank you for being with us here um in this conversation now uh, you can ask questions um there's applauses coming in here <laughs> virtual applauses ask a question directly uh, through tabita or write it in the chat um but but you know always always use the moment there's no such thing as a stupid question by the way no this is this is the chance to be directly talking um, oh, and stretch your butt. Yeah, that's good. That's good advice. <sighs> so, do we have someone daring with a question? Victoria, how about you? I'm gonna turn. Okay, now I <clears throat> I couldn't unmute myself. Yeah. Um, hi, uh, Tabita. Um, I would like to know. Um, did you went to art university? And if yes, 
um, uh, did you make the same kind of work in the beginning, um, like this healing, spiritual field, art, or was it something different before? Okay. Uh, I didn't really go to art school. Uh, I mean, I went, but I went to do a research uh, master. So it's just writing. Uh, so I didn't have a, a practice uh, in art school. So my practice started when I left. Uh, art school kind of you know but uh, in a way to answer I wrote my thesis about um, cruelty and ecstasy in like performance and film so it was about like the metaphysics of um, of the being what was it called I, the scream of resistance so ex I don't know some stuff like this you know so I think I made the kind of theoretical or like research or like, you know, like growing the the sensitivity to what it is that I wanted to express throughout this time and then it found expression somehow after. Mm -hmm. yes. But it was already in a way, you know, like connected, but it was much more political than what it is uh, now or maybe it is still now you know in a, a different way thank you also for the question thank victoria you. thank you for your bravery to break the ice yes uh, yeah I'm much appreciated and you can do better um guys and now another question here from the crowd that's fine no pressure no yeah mm -hmm. but it's it's um always um after such a long talk obviously difficult to kind of enter with another question you covered a lot of ground in the work of this thanks again victoria there's also a moment to ask bob how about you uh i don't know i think it's First, in the kind of like your connection is not so well, so I, I couldn't really understand what you just said. Mm, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. My brother also is Bob. Akuma, I get a question um, from Augusto. Thank you, Tapita, for this exchange. My question is about the possibility of healing the stones and sculpture, sculptures of their past. So remove the weight of their ancestors. Ah, interesting. So right. about, about monuments, basically, in the city. The statues, figures, maybe whatever, colonial past, whatever, in Germany, Nazi past. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm taking it a bit further, but again, the possibility. No, you're of... narrowing. It's not further. Okay. You're narrowing no, no, the question. You're, you're right, but only because I <laughs> know Augusto. So my question is about the possibility <laughs> of healing the stones and sculptures right. of their past, remove right. the weight of the ancestors. So Beautiful question, Augusto. Thank there's you. There's a lot I can say because I love stones, and I feel very connected to stones. And uh, okay, I can send you a gist if you're interested in some of my late works about stone uh, that are not online. Uh, so yeah, I did a whole series of work about stone circles in the uh, African stone circles because you have many in like Senegal, in Gambia, in South Africa, Zimbabwe, Egypt, like all over Kenya, there's like stone circles, you know? And in Europe as well, as many people know. Um, but it's like somehow, somewhere, humanity throughout the entire globe thought that for some reason they had to erect stones in a circle. And it's not, you know, I mean, there's many, many reasons for this. So I went on a quest for several years across many countries talking to like people, elders about the power of stone. 
and basically what I gathered, you know, so that is from many different fields of, uh, of knowledge, is that stone has the capacity to retain memory. Even in ancient India, they say that many sages at the end of their lives, if they had not yet met uh, a, a disciple that had enough capacity to hold everything that the, the, the master knew, they would put, dissolve their being or knowledge into a mountain. That's why people came, you know, visit those mountains to hope to receive that information. So stone, if a certain like uh, process is done to them, they can be almost like living entities. No? Or uh, they can become the body of a whole like library of, uh, of teachings, of, of subtle energy. And that's why certain stones have the power to, to heal, you know, because something has been done to them so that they carry that, uh, that energy. And throughout the world, you know, people go touch certain mountains or certain stone and pass down that this stone has that capacity because it has a memory, you know. And so the question was, okay, so that was about the possibility of stone. So that is something I... I believe very much in, but even beyond that, that I've experienced myself, you know, going to all those like ancient stone circles around the world, is that something very powerful happened. It's almost as if my life kind of like changed after each of these visits, it gave me something. It's like I received like a, a guidance from those stones, you know, so you can, I mean, you can create intimacy with all life form and stones minerals are also you know a, a life form you know that has a life energy you know it's just part of life the same way as we are and then sculptures yeah that's um slightly different uh or maybe not you know because a, a form, you know, as we said, has a, a song. You know? And so if you do a form of a human being, of a special being, maybe their energy is carried through, you know? And often, you know, like people always say like, yeah, Europeans, they don't care about their ancestors. You know, it's all like African things, you know, like, but actually there's such a deep tradition of ancestral reverence in Europe through those sculptures, you know? All those people who are erected and like revered and to not forget their names, you know? And to, so this is in a way a, an ancestral practice that has been put in place, you know, to honor certain people. The thing is that often, well, it's questionable the choice of the people who were honored, you know, and for what they were honored. And so the energy of a sculpture can pertain the energy of the person that it represents, but also the energy of the people that gathered in order to honor that person, you know, because the sculpture is somehow ceremonial. You know, there's a, a bow, you know, that comes from a, a reverence, let's say, even if it's not physical and you don't like literally bow, but there's a, that quality of reverence in like installing a, 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 a statue, you know? And so that is, I don't ways to remove. So I don't know if you can remove, You maybe there's processes you could, you know? Actually, you could potentially, but then kids. Okay, okay, I'm gonna talk quickly and then yes. We have only ten minutes left and another okay. question, so let's um, okay. we'll wrap it up quickly. Yeah, okay. but a lot of great responses already to Augusto's okay. question. Okay, so I've been shut down, so that's it, Augusto. Thank you. No, no, no. You said wrap. You can wrap it up, <laughs> keeping the, the time in mind. Right, right, right. Okay, okay. Um, why can't you guys hear me? Oh, I'm sorry, Bob. So, uh, no, the next question is by Elena. I read it to you. Um, 
there was um uh, what? Okay, I there's think... a lot of questions coming in. Guys, now last minute, you're all getting excited here. So uh, what exactly, Elena Grossi is asking, what exactly pushed you to start living in nature? Has your artistic practice been influenced by this change of environment, this journey from the urban to the rural? <clears throat> yes, definitely. Big, 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 yes. Uh, it has changed uh, the whole of me. Like, uh, literally, on, I guess on many levels. Uh, so why, I can't really say, but uh, everything I was living in South Africa then, and you know, I had my artistic practice going great, like a spiritual community there, like friends, political community, like, you know, I was settled. And then there's a voice in my head, like, you have to go to French Guiana, you have to go to French Guiana. And I was like, ah, ah, no, no, like, why? And then it came, it came, it came, and then I was like, okay, one year and i came one year and then it's two and now it's four and at first i was like i don't know why i'm doing here you know i'm alone like literally like what the and then suddenly it made sense like the i think it's the call of the forest you know the call of working with the land and now starting farming studies you know and now i just you know starting with land i have a farm a cacao farm so i think it's a uh, a calling, you know, that I gathered the, the courage to, to answer, really answer. I mean, I needed something else. I was not, I had everything that, you know, you can ask for, you know, security, success in my work, da, da, da. But I was like, there's something else, you know, that I know I need, you know, to to understand or to, you know, and I was also a bit miserable, you know, doing that, you know, flight artist life. So I think, you know, the land being rooted, like planting, it gives you a, a, a depth, you know, a different depth that I was searching for. So it has gave me a, a, a depth and a humility a huge humility that you're so small in the forest, you know, and the art world is always make, trying to make you so big, you know, and and so I think that is what I needed, you know, to just become very, very small. So, yeah. uh, thank you, Elena, for the question. And so, we have another one, guys. Now you're warming up. Uh, Victor Reiter is asking one and more question. And Bob was also before. But yeah, Bob, I... he, Bob is reformulating. I did, yeah. I did, I sent my question. Okay, we're going to read it. Yeah, so we're going to read it. Know... So, uh, Victor and Bob, uh, the last two questions. Um, and um, okay, since uh, Victor is saying one more question, we do that as the last. And Bob again, he was asking about community life um, um, and living in a community. Um, yes. with, ourselves away and it's hard to be in a community working with people um and you first said we should be gentle to ourselves and let it go slowly like it should be but then you said that it's still difficult to be in a community so i would like to know what you did or how you deal with it okay um okay. um i'm just gonna read quickly because i understand better like this yeah Okay, it goes twice. Okay, sorry. Um, I'm still figuring it out, to be honest. You know, like uh, I think, I think you can do something that is hard while being gentle on yourself. You know, doing something that is hard doesn't mean that you have to be hard on yourself. That's something that is different. You know, you can be, I don't know, climbing a mountain. You know, and doing something that's very hard physically but then being completely relaxed you know as you do it and that is something okay i mean that in yoga practice we train each other you know to do this to do a certain posture or to hold something that it's hard or that 
but then you have to learn to be completely loose, like relaxed, but alert, firm in the posture. And that is such a delicate balance that it's very hard to achieve, you know? But if you practice this on a very like kind of you know, physical way, it's in order to have that capacity in one's life, you know, to be fully committed, fully engaged, fully, you know, focused. But a little de detached, you know, a little loose in the, the process. So that's what I'm trying to cultivate, you know, and that I think we should all try to somehow cultivate. Because otherwise we take ourselves too seriously. Very good point. So then we take Victor as the last question. Very nice uh, uh, question now, Bob. I understood it now. Great answer, Tabita. Um, so Victor is asking, um, do you see a way for Western societies to reconnect or to incorporate the spiritual, magical, communal wisdom of other cultures that have managed to still retain this part of human existence without complete dismantling Western way of living? Whew. <laughs> so, that's a big one. <laughs> Yes, it's a big one, but it's actually a very important question, you know. Um, okay, so my answer is not politically correct. So I'm going to disclaim, you know, for, for those who might be a little uh, annoyed, you know, by what I say. Um, so I think uh, globally at the moment there's this understanding of uh, cultural appropriation, mm -hmm. which is a very important uh, concept and, uh, and notion, you know. Um, okay, I don't know how I'm going to say it. get away with this, but it's fine. <laughs> um, but I think, okay, first thing, First, the first thing is I think there's such a, yes, I guess a, a trauma in Western cultures or like a enforcement of logic, you know, that has been there for so long already that people have really removed themselves from uh, the dimension beyond logic. But they are there and they've always been there for every culture. European also have like their mystics, have their medicinal, uh, traditional healers, have their way of like uh, divination, have their plants, have their, you know, like it was there. But then there's the whole like, you know, burn, uh, witch burn. So they've burned all their, all their witches. So many of that uh, knowledge has gone. But I think it's really important for Europeans and I speak for myself, I'm also half European descent, you know, to explore the cosmology of Europe, you know, instead of trying and, you know, go to Peru or Africa or da da da, where it's still alive and try and learn this. Because, I mean, that's after my non PC point is coming. But the first thing I think is this, you know, like it's important because spiritual gifts come from our ancestry and when you do works of healing or spiritual work you have to be connected to your lineage you know because it comes it's passed down and then you collaborate with them so often people who have visions or you know certain it's not really them it's coming through them you know so it's nothing of you so you can in not order, you know to open up to this you have to collaborate with your ancestors and then you need to practice something that they practiced otherwise that link is not is not made you know so i think that's something very important to understand in one's journey to go back to what was practiced in their own lineage you know so that is kind of the against like i mean it's always against cultural appropriation but then you know because it's not helpful actually for people. Then the second part, and I think what is helpful is to be inspired. So it's absolutely fine for me to be inspired by indigenous you know, spiritual practice or African spiritual practice or Asian spiritual practice or, you know, or places where it still exists, you know, because it's gonna 
create that yearning to know more that thirst you know and that's that's beautiful because we need this you know as a as a world to be more conscious about those things so if it helps you to conscientize your being by you know exploring what's been done elsewhere that's fine but then to actually practice things that don't relate to you i'm not sure you know that is very helpful and politically it becomes a bit tricky but then and that's what's not pc is that the world of like spirit has nothing to do with the world of politics and often it creates like some um, you know so some people maybe of european descent may need to be initiated in certain practice because maybe they had an ancestor that they had forgotten you know that come from there with all the you know through slavery there's been many you know like rapes and other things or like wars you know many cross threads you know of uh, of people so we may not know and we have a great great ancestor that's chilling out there trying to you know pass on their things and that's why somehow people go to another culture and today it seems that oh yes they're appropriating i mean maybe most people are but sometimes it's genuine something that needs to be done for this person so so yeah i, I don't know i think it's a little complicated but uh, for inspiration i think it's fine then for other things i don't know yeah thank you to be there there's actually now interesting enough, even though we're running um, over time, more questions coming in. Um, um, Augusto was also asking, is it possible for some of them to contact you, maybe via email, to ask you a question afterwards? Yes, so I'm going to put my email here in the chat. So this is my work email. So you can contact me anytime. I answer to everybody, but with my own time. So. <laughs> <laughs> I like that one. Yes. Okay, but that's great. And that's a very, that's a very generous Amakaba. offer. Amakaba. No. Okay, so this is my new vision. The my farm. So you can also come volunteer on my farm if you want someday. Up. I will Up. also make sure I will put um, a lot of links in in the Moodle. Uh, so of all the projects that she's done and the different videos, I'll put a lot of links in our Moodle course. Um, that said, um, and Patty, say that again. No, there was Patty that had a question, but maybe we don't have time. Again. Yeah, and maybe we can ask these questions also because we're running over time now. Okay. Um, via um, then possibly via email. It's very generous of you to kind of share these. I will share with the with the class in, um, in another digital um, format all the different links to your different projects and groups and collectives and, and films, so they kind of get an idea as well. Um, I would like to thank you so much, um, Tabita, for for your inspirations and also. Are oh, you gone? No, I'm here. But hope you can see me. No. Oh no. Yes, I can hear you. Yes, I can hear ah, okay, you. Okay, good, good. And then, so, yeah, I do that. Thank you is what I wanted to say for for the inspirations and also kind of for taking us to French Guayana now. Um, I would also thank you all for, for being here. Like a big applause to you again, Tabitha. Um, uh, thank you for the whole group uh, today. Um, it was a very special talk and a very unusual talk again that we had here. And um, in your own works, Tabita, can you still hear me? Yes. Okay, because I can't see you anymore for some reason. Ah. Um, may you all walk free, guided, and supported, because we are never alone. So um, I'm quoting you from India. I think our our internet time is up. Now we're breaking up. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, thank you so much for that. Guys, um, goodbye for now. Stay safe. Take care of yourself. Uh, and see you next year, actually, on January 3rd, for the talk by visual artist Isaac Kariwaki, uh, who will be joining us from Kenya. Um, again, Tabita, thank you so much. Blessings. Thank you, everybody. Much love. Okay, thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bisous, bisous.